welcome to the IFFGD 2023 Advocacy Event. My name is Cecilia Rooker. I'm the President and Executive Director for the International Foundation for Gastrointestinal Disorders, and we are thrilled to have you guys with us here today. For those of you who have attended this event in the past, you know that this is not your typical Hill event. For many um, organizations, they have what they call fly-in days. You fly in, you go to the Hill, you meet with your congressional offices, and then you fly out and you go home, which is fantastic. But here at IFFGD, we feel like if we can get you all together, we want to give a little bit of education as well. So we've turned our fly-in day into a two-day event, and we call it our advocacy event. So today will be a day of education. We're going to talk more about advocating. This year's theme is more about advocating on the Hill. Uh, we received from feedback. Uh, last year that people felt like they really wish they had more practice, some more understanding of what's going to happen in those meetings on the Hill. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. And hopefully by the end of today, you're going to feel confident and prepared to go meet with your congressional offices tomorrow and really feel like you are just completely confident and know exactly what you're, what you're talking about and what you're do, going in there to do. And that when you leave, most importantly, you feel like you've really been heard and that you've been able to get across to your congressional office what you want them to know what your concerns are as their constituent because that folks is why they're here right and that's why we are here because they want to hear from us and hopefully throughout the course of today we're going to help you to be able to do that uh, very succinctly and with confidence and make sure that you're telling your own story your agenda and what is that is important to you if you have any questions comments thoughts suggestions throughout this entire day this is a very very informal meeting so please just raise your hand speak out talk ask questions we really really want to hear from you guys because this education piece is about you guys it's about you learning what we've heard you wanted to learn so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the program so what we're doing today, like I said, is educating about different things that we want to talk about with our lawmakers. And one of the main things that we do in these is talk about bills that will make a difference to the American people. And so we've got some great guest speakers up here that are going to talk about specific pieces of legislation and how they affect the GI community. Maybe it's something that resonates with you, maybe not. And if it is, it may be something you want to talk about. So we're going to give you more information about those bills. But first, we're going to take a step back and we're going to talk about what, what the process is for a, a bill becoming a law. And I'm just going to be honest with you. My name is not Yoshi Rooker. Yoshi Rooker is my daughter. And she did this talk in 2019 for our Hill event. And so I just stole her slides. And I figured I should give her credit. Um, considering she's 17 now and she would probably be really upset if I didn't. So this was her talk in 2019 and I thought that maybe it might be good to do a little bit of a refresher about what happens and how do things go from a great idea to being enacted into law in our congressional um, system. So, okay. Yeah, th those are all hers too, by the way. Um, so basically, in, when you start, someone has a, a big idea. They say, hey, you know, it'd be really great if, you know? And so that's sort of how it is born. And then you just get this idea, right? The idea, and then someone has to go to a, their legislator and say, hey, I had this idea, will you support it as a member of Senate or a member of House, right? So then they work with the House to draft the legislation. Right, so then it takes this first little steps and who, whoever decides to help be on board, whether it be a senator's office or house of representative, they work with the people with the big idea and the bill is drafted and then it is introduced by that person who is considered its sponsor. One thing to remember is that the Senate and House are two completely different um, unit bodies, right? And so this has to be done in both. So if you have a great idea, you go to, you find someone in the house that's going to be your, your sponsor, your champion, they're going to help you write a bill. You also have to go to the Senate and do the same thing all over again. One is not going to be good enough for both. So once you do that, and then you have someone in the Senate that's introducing someone in the house that's introducing, then the bill is on the floor. 
And then they get a number. And so when you see the different bills and it's like S dot one, two, three, or H R dot one, two, three, that's the, the number. It will be different for Senate and House because they really just, they just go in order, right? They just go up the number chain. So it depends on when the bill is introduced in each of those bodies. So then it goes to a committee within that particular body. They're are going to, they're gonna take that legislation, they're gonna look over it, they're gonna write it up, okay? And then they're gonna send it back to whoever it was that it, so the House is gonna get it back or the Senate's gonna get it back. And then they're gonna take this newly sort of tweaked bill and begin and vote on it. Now it can pass the House and not pass the Senate, right? We can have the say have a bill pass the Senate for step therapy and a bill pass the House for step therapy and they're not the same, right? So then what has to happen is they um, after the House and the floor they go oh, have um, voted. Then the two have to come together. And then you get some people from the Senate together, some people from the House together, and they're going to debate. So they're gonna to come together, they're, they're gonna to debate amongst each other. The House is gonna say, okay, you, you wanted this, we wanted this. How are we gonna compromise? Um, and then they have a unified bill that makes it to the president. So, and, and of course, after it's all voted on by everybody, right? So then it goes to the president. And unfortunately, it's not done here, right? The president has to sign it into law or not. And if he doesn't, it can sit on his desk. So he has, he has a couple different options. The first one is he can say, yes, sign it. We have a bill. Um, or veto it and say, we don't have a bill, right? Or he can um, send it back and then Congress can override it. That takes a lot of people to do that. Or he can sit in on his desk and do nothing with it and after 10 days, it becomes a law. So that's his way of saying, I don't agree, I do, I may, may agree, may not, I don't wanna put my, my sign on it, but I'm gonna let it pass anyway. But that's a lot of steps to go through. And every piece of legislation has to go through all of those steps within a two year period. So Congress works in congressional sessions. Those sessions last two years. If you don't get it to here by December, in January, you start all over again at step one. So it doesn't matter how many people you got to sign on, how many people you said they agreed, you're starting all over again in the next congressional session. So that gets really hard, and I know that, and it gets frustrating, but how many of you guys have heard of the Pollock Penalty Law um, legislation? Have you heard of that? So the Pollock Penalty was something that happened several years ago. It's been over 10 years, if I'm correct, like 15 maybe. Um, yeah, it's, it's been ever since um, when, when Medicare uh, started covering more options, and they started mm. screening. So the way Medicare is billed. Hold on a second. Samira, I'm coming to you. So when uh, colonoscopy screening was covered by Medicare starting around 2000 or so, um, if it was uh, on the colonoscopy, if you didn't find anything, then you bill it as a diagnostic procedure screening, it's covered fully. If your doctor, for example, me found a polyp, we have to bill it and we remove the polyp, we bill it as colonoscopy with polypectomy, that's the correct way to bill it. But then CMS would see it as a therapeutic procedure and then a copay would apply, so we call it the polyp penalty. And we said to, to CMS and, and Medicare and Congress, this makes no sense. The whole idea is to cover preventative services, so there shouldn't be a polyp penalty. And CMS said, you're right, but we can't rule on that. Congress has to say that and tell us specifically. So we started lobbying for this actually back in around 2002, 2003, um, and it took us almost 20 years to get it passed because uh, people who were said, well, okay, it makes sense, but what's the cost of it? And the Congressional Budget Office didn't give us a cost for a while, and it finally got it. We got lots of sponsors, and we had to keep pushing for it, and it was multiple organizations, the American College of Gastroenterology, other GI organizations, the DDNC, other patient groups, uh, colon cancer, and we finally got it passed, uh, I think a year and a half ago. Um, so um, it's, it's 
it's sobering how much you have to keep pushing to get something that makes sense and people agree with you through um, that way. But in 20 years, we did get it through, right? So yeah, that was frustrating, but what if we had done nothing, right? Then today, people would still have the pilot penalty. So it's important what you do. It's important that you go. And even if you feel like, you know, I did this last year and it's frustrating, I understand that. But eventually we will get across the finish line. And it's a matter of just repetition and doing it over and over again. And so we appreciate you doing that. Over the next couple talks, we're going to talk about some very specific pieces of legislation that um, are um, what we call part of the IFFGD legislative um, priorities. And so every year as an organization, we look at what we consider to be sort of the biggest things that impact the most people in our community or impact people very strongly. Um, there's also a network of health-related patient advocacy organizations that come together and try to have a, amplify our voices. Um, and these particular two things that we're going to talk about today, it's not just patients, it's also our um, health care um, groups as well. So we're actually going to be hearing from someone from next from the American College of Gastroenterology. And um, he's going to talk to us a lot about um, a, one particular piece of legislation. And then uh, Samir Shah actually is going to talk about another one. Both of these pieces of legislation are at different places in this life cycle. And they're going to tell you where they are and help you to understand more about them. And then later in the breakout sessions, we're going to learn more about how you can target your message as to exactly where they are. And so some congressional offices may have signed on, some may not know anything about it at all. Um, so some are supporters or not, but it depends on where they are in this cycle. Um, however, just to let you know, none of them passed either the Senate or the House in the last congressional session. We had a lot of support for step therapy last year, so we came very close, um, but it actually just, it didn't, we didn't get across the finish line. So we're really hopeful. We're trying to start early this year. So that's why we're here in the spring. Um, American College of Gastronology is bringing their fly in later this week. So we're doing a two, like one, two punch this week with patients coming in and talking about how this is important and how the needs of the patient of the GI community is important. And then the ACG is coming in from a physician side and saying, we agree with the patients. These are the, you know, these are the issues that, that we see also as physicians. And so we're hoping that that's going to make an impact. Our first speaker is actually Brad Conway. Brad Conway works for the American College of Gastroenterology, and he uh, runs their advocacy efforts. And you know, one of the things Brad and I realized just late last year is just how much our legislative priorities really do align. And um, thanks to Eric Shaw, who actually has been advocating with IFFGD and them, he was like, "Light bulb, let's let's do something together." So we're really excited to have him. He's going to talk to us today <clears throat> about the. Um, which one are you doing? You're doing step therapy. step therapy. That's what I thought. All right. So step therapy has been through several congressional sessions. We um, and it is definitely an issue for many people. Brad's going to talk to us a little bit more about that um, and where we are in the process. Oh, great, great. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, my name is Brad Conway. Again, I'm with the American College of Gastroenterology, and I'm here to talk about um, uh, step therapy. So, okay. So my goals of the presentation today. I have 10 minutes, so I just wanted to give you some background on step therapy. I feel a little awkward talking to patient advocates about step therapy because you probably have lived it. Um, and so we can go through the bill, we can go through some steps in how to advocate for the bill leading up to the breakout sessions, and then I have some follow-up tips as well. So step therapy, I'm sure many of you know, is um, you know, it's a way for insurers to kind of manage costs. Um, it's a drug, man, it's a drug utilization management tool. Um, and again, I feel a little awkward because some of you have lived, breathed this issue. It's where you know, a physician and you want to use a course of treatment and the insurer says, why don't you try this first? Or you need to do this course first. So it's a step up therapy and that's why we get the name. But uh, fortunately, and according to uh, Yoshi's uh, presentation, it's born out of an idea. So this idea what we had many patient advocates um, coming to and physicians who are advocates for their patients coming to Congress and saying this needs to change this is not working it's bad for the patient it's bad for patient care it does not save money 
and it, at the end of the day, it just is overall bad for public health. And so many Congresses, and now this is maybe the third iteration of the State SEP Act. And fortunately, the House bill was just introduced last week. Um, and so what it does, it provides uh, exemptions for certain, um, five exemptions for uh, where a, the provider and the patients can um, you know, override these uh, step therapy protocols. Uh, one thing to note, it's, this bill only applies to a certain type of health plan under ERISA. So it does not apply to Medicaid, it does not apply to Medicare, um, it does not apply to commercial insurers. Those are largely regulated by the state. Um, but the good news is, and I'll get to this in a little bit, but just keep that in mind. But there are five exceptions. You know, one, if the patient has tried and failed. Uh, two, if this will cause irreversible consequences. The third, if it will cause harm to the patient. And the fourth, if it will kind of prevent from the just daily living activities. And, and the fifth is with, um, you know, if the patient is stable on their current medication. So, uh, so Dr. Shaw and Dr. Shaw usually um, experience this with IBD patients. Um, and many of you may have constipation drugs or other GI uh, you know, you know, drugs. It's just it's hard for the patient and the provider to get on a, a course of treatment that the patient and provider want to do. The insurer may have different ideas. And so this is what we're, uh, the bill that we're trying to you know, pass this Congress. And it also has um, kind of an exemption request, so deadlines for notifications, where you can begin that process and get an answer a lot quicker. All right, so my first advocacy tip for you is, again, I feel awkward talking to you, patient advocates, about step therapy. So I just want you to remember who you are, remember your story. Um, and many of you have lived this, many of you have breathed this, your family members, loved ones have gone through this, your patients, and I want you to remind your, the members of Congress and staff tomorrow that what your personal story is. Um, I went to the um, Digestive Disease uh, National Coalition advocacy event, uh, was it last month, and you know, being part of those meetings with patient advocates as they're advocating for bills is a powerful message. So please forget, don't forget who you are, don't forget why you're here, and you know, you're passionate, you're obviously here for a reason, and we're thankful for your doing this. I mean, because many, uh, like I said, many of you have lived this, breathed this, and have, um, you know, this needs to be known. So please tell your story. Um, also, personal story with data is, adds to the message. So, and I'm happy to share some of this data, but there's some data out there that, you know, shows how restrictive uh, step therapy is in terms of patient safety, um, in terms of whether it, you know, coincides with clinical guidelines. Um, so please, you know, and then I think in your uh, packets that uh, Haley had forward last week, there's a, a white paper on step therapy that's based, uh, that's from the uh, DDNC too. So, you know, I'm happy to forward and happy to talk more about the studies, but just as we, like, I guess, maybe talk about this in the breakout sessions, you know, let's think about what you can say in terms of what the clinical data suggests. And obviously you'll be speaking to members of Congress and staff, um, so you need to know kind of what the legislative speak is and what, uh, what they hold dear in terms of you know, passing legislation that is important to, their, and their, to them and their constituents. You know, the first is, do they already support the bill? Um, you know, in the Senate, this bill was introduced a few weeks ago. Um, so if they did, I think your message is a simple thank you and how can we get other senators in our state to, to pass the bill or to support the bill rather. Um, in the House, you know, just let them know that you know, this bill was just introduced last week. Um, I, many members uh, and staff may not know this, so you'll be the bearer of good news. Um, you know, as uh, Cecile mentioned, uh, this bill, and there's other iterations of this bill, last Congress this was a widely supported bill. You know, roughly 200 members in the House supported the bill, and you know, 30, roughly 30, uh, 40 members in the Senate supported the bill. So. Just look at the bill. We can. I'm happy to show you where we can find co-sponsors of the bill uh, last year, and then go into those meetings knowing, oh, this member of Congress supported the same bill last Congress. It didn't pass last Congress, but let's get going this year. Um, and it, I think it has some, you know, holds some weight with uh, congressional members and with their staff. 
Um, and again, I mentioned this is a seg this uh, bill covers you know a small segment of health insurance, but many states have passed their own step therapy laws in states. That is important to note to your members of Congress and staff. If you are I don't know in Massachusetts and you're with the Massachusetts delegation, um, you, you can look to see oh you know Massachusetts recently passed a step therapy. That is important for um, you know staff as well. Just kind of keep it local, keep it personalized, as well as keep it kind of a, you know, in the legislative and policy speak too. You know, so do they support the bill? Thank you. How can we get others on? You know, did you support the bill last Congress? Great, let's do it again. And you want to be consistent with your state. So here's what your state is doing. So please, you know, consider this bill. Um, you may get questions, and you know sometimes questions like can you a little be off-putting, but questions are good. That means the staff are actually engaged. I mean, I'm sure some of you have been in meetings when the person's on their phone and giving you a few head nods, and not really, you're not really thinking you're getting the message across. But questions are really good. You know, some of the popular questions that you may get on this is this. You know, does step therapy actually control costs? I mean, we're the federal government. We're trying to save money. You know. Healthcare budgets are exploding, both at the state and the federal level. But does it control costs? Well, I think your you know answer is again with some data that shows that maybe it doesn't. You know, outside of it being bad for patients and patient safety and patient care, it may actually not cost the. It may actually not save insurers money in the long term. And I'm happy to forward this data too. Um, and you know, the one, the second question is. is how much will it cost us to, to pass this bill? How much will the CBO score is? The CBO is the Congressional Budget Office. They are the, you know, kind of the accountants on the Hill. They're the financial analysts who say, okay, here's what the bill says. You know, over a 10-year window, here's how much we expect the federal government to spend to pass this bill and to implement the bill. Um, many people, especially in healthcare, like if the CBO score is high, it makes it a lot harder to pass the bill. And so right now there is no score, but you know, to your point, like to, you can get to your advocacy message asking for help getting a score, asking for help for congressional hearings, to go through the personal stories, getting through the data, and to remind Congress that this bill only applies to ERISA. It does not apply to Medicare. It does not apply to Medicaid. It does not apply to other public health programs, which suggests that the CBO score should be lower. Um, so that's two common questions that you may get tomorrow. It's usually the, the second one. It's CBO score. How much I have to know, let my boss know how much this bill costs. Um, so that is always common that we see. Um, but again, you know, you may get someone who's engaged and is you know, thinking about how the federal government can control costs. Um, and that will be um, a question as well. And lastly, um, so you, this is kind of a map of the, the office. You have your member of Congress, you have your chief of staff, and you have your DC office, which, whom you'll be meeting with tomorrow. Um, after you leave today, or tomorrow rather, don't forget about the other half. I mean, each house and each Senate office has state staff. There, um, you know, you go back to your homes, go back to your states, follow up with them. Obviously, send an email and follow up with the congressional staff with whom you're meeting with uh, tomorrow. But the state staff is just as important. You know, they're looking for help. They're looking to uh, do more constituent services. It's a smaller staff. It's a little bit more informal. You may actually get a better chance to meet the member of Congress. But go home, follow up with the state staff. You know, they're willing to help, they want to help, and it kind of gets the, uh, the, the DC team a little bit, um, you know, it, it helps them to know that, you know, state staff are monitoring their issues here at the DC level too. So um, I would suggest you ask who the you know, state director is or the district director, if it's a house member, um, and then kind of reach out to him or her after your meetings next week. Um, and that is pretty much what I have, but I know I had to kind of pack a lot in in 10 minutes, but I'm happy to answer any questions, or I think if we're going to be doing some breakout sessions later, I don't know, I don't want to commandeer a bit more time. So yeah, so we're going to do the breakout sessions. Can you say your question for Q&A? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. So we're going to do a Q&A <laughs> here in a few minutes. Oh. Thank you, Brad. 
And remember, there will be breaks. We're going to have a reception, so there's plenty of time to ask questions um, to any of our speakers. I know step therapy has been around, and there's a lot of questions about that um, that people have had experience. I know I have with my health care, personally. Our next speaker is very, very special. Um, this is uh, Dr. Samir Shaw. He's the immediate past president of the ACG. <clears throat> and um, and actually a very dear friend of, of advocates in GI. He was the past president of the Digestive Disease National Coalition and um, has been working side by side with patients through the DDNC for many, many years um, here on the Hill, um, year after year. Um, as IFFGD is also a member of the Digestive Disease Coalition, so I've had the pleasure of working beside Samir now for many years and, um, and watching him be able to really help sort of bring in that physician perspective beside the patient perspective on different issues on the Hill. Today he's gonna to talk about copay accumulators, which is something that is sort of the new kid on the block. One of the things that's really big on the Hill with healthcare right now is they out of, out of just control healthcare costs, right? and how we feel like we're playing whack-a-mole, right? Like you feel like you've got an issue and we, we try to address that and that helps curb costs and then something else comes up. So um, while we were trying to focus on step therapy in the last few years, um, copay accumulators sort of roused its head and is really financially affecting a lot of people. So Dr. Shaw is going to talk to us a little bit about that and um, we appreciate you being here. It was uh, really thank you for that really warm welcome. Um, Cecilia and I have worked together for many years with the DDNC, so she's a, a friend and a colleague, and she is great. Uh, so uh, you guys are lucky to have her, and we're lucky to have her as part of DDNC, so uh, thanks. Um, this is a picture of Providence, uh, where I live and practice, and that's our office. Uh, I'm in a nine-person uh, group uh, there. So. Um, when I submitted this, I had no disclosures. I do have a disclosure. In March, I went to India with a group of other faculty uh, to, to uh, talk about the best uh, uh, science at ACG, and we did get paid for that by Lupin Pharmaceuticals, so that's my one disclosure now. It's the, bo it's the bottom arrow. Oh, sorry. Didn't pop her up. Thanks. So let's start with a little background. So in terms of um, healthcare costs, and this is data from the American Medical Association, in 2021, $4.3 billion, uh, or 12, over 12,000 per capita, and that represented about 18.3% uh, of the GDP compared with 19.7% in 2020. The average salary, according to ZipRecruiter in the U.S., is 58,000. Remember, the ACA Act, Obamacare, expanded uh, health care access uh, back in, in, in uh, around 2013, um, and the idea was better coverage. There's been a trend by insurers to shift costs to pay patients, and that's where co-pays come in. And, um, and as you all know, the U.S. pays more for health care than any other country. So this is national health care expenditures uh, over time, uh, and you can see it's been rising, and that's why um, when we talk about anything um, in terms of health care, our congressional uh, uh, um, our representatives appropriately want to know about costs and the CBO score, et cetera. And this is very sobering, too. This is prescription drug costs for Medicare, and this is kind of reflected also in private insurers, the, the, the amount of, of money that's spent on, 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 on drug therapy. This is kind of sobering. This is the percentage of, of what we pay in the United States compared to other westernized countries. We can look at Canada and countries in, in Europe or Japan. We end up paying a lot more, um, uh, and uh, um, it's been hard to, to get our drug costs under control. So in terms of uh, health care dollars, uh, uh, where did it go? You can see that uh, most of it went to hospital care and physician services, but uh, uh, almost 9% uh, went to prescription drug costs. And then, you know, who's, who's paying the bill? Well, CMS, which is Medicare and Medicaid, pays uh, nearly uh, just over 38%, private insurance 28%, but all of us as individuals pay about 10% uh, uh, of these costs, in, you know, beyond um, uh, what we pay for our health insurance. So what are copayment accumulators? So most insurances have a deductible, usually between two and 10,000. Most are in the five or 10,000 range. And after your deductible is met, then everything's supposed to be fully covered. 
and the insurance paid for all, all covered services and medicines. What you pay for in copayment services, whether they're office visits, emergency room, uh, pharma pharmacy, uh, x-rays, etc., cetera, uh, all count. And then this has included copayments made on your behalf um, through programs via pharma. So why copayments? Well, it was a way to reduce costs, and also um, in terms of healthcare premiums, that way you had a stake in the game. If it was just everything was free, that, that insurers and, and, and regulars felt that, that people would overutilize stuff and not think about costs. So that was the idea, it seemed to make sense. Um, and so it incentivized employees to choose deductible plans with the idea of saving money. So, you know, I can remember uh, when I started my practice, we didn't have any uh, uh, deductibles in our health insurance program. But what we paid for ourselves and our employees to, to cover them for insurance kept going up. And we said, well, how can we control costs? They said, well, we have this plan which said deductible. Um, so what we did in our group, uh, we're nine physicians, we have about um, 40, 45 employees, is we have a high deductible plan. So uh, basically five to 10,000, whether it's an individual or family plan. And then um, the doctors are all exposed to that copay, but we have a second insurance that covers our employees for the copayment um, to, to do that. A lot of companies do that to, as a way to reduce their, their costs. So again, uh, most commercial insurances have deductibles. My plan has the 5K, uh, 10K deductible. So what do copayment accumulators do? They track the money um, that's uh, paid uh, by by um, any of these uh, programs that pharma has, and they don't count towards your deductible. So basically, the insurance gets paid twice. It's double dipping, right? So they get paid by the um, uh, copayment program, and then they ask you to pay again a second time. Um, and copayment programs are not allowed by Medicare and Medicaid, um, so that actually limits access to certain expensive drugs. And we have to have this discussion where we talk about these drugs with our patients who are on a Medicare or Medicaid product. If they have commercial insurance, they can uh, access that, but then if they have this copayment program, they want money from you, and then the costs become high and patients don't take their medicines. So. This started out in 2018 with pharmacy benefits managers rolled out these copayment accumulator programs. And they target drugs that are expensive, like the drugs, biologics that we use in inflammatory bowel disease, but any drug basically that, that they think is expensive to them. And then, you know, the, the plan sponsors, employees, help them save a lot of money because they ended up shifting the cost from them either to the uh, uh, pharmaceutical company or to the patient or more likely both. And then, uh, um, uh, it prevents the patients from applying to their, to their copay. So what are the consequences? Well, in 2017, 69% um, of commercially insured patients did not fill prescriptions when they had greater than 250 uh, uh, copay uh, cards. And then that led to probably uh, between 100 and 300 uh, a billion of avoidable health care because of patients uh, then ending up in the emergency room or hospital because they, they weren't on their medicine. And, and that's only the direct cost. That doesn't include the suffering, the indirect costs of you know, family members or, or lost the time uh, from education or work, et cetera. So this is from the, um, the white paper that the DNC published with uh, Ralph McKibben as, as, uh, as lead author. But so let's say a patient's on a growth hormone injection pen, they're expensive, qualifies for copayment insurance. The, the insurance coming does not count uh, the copay as part of the deductible, so that when that copay runs out, they've got to pay again, and then they're getting paid twice, and that leads to oftentimes noncompliance. So this is another example. So in scenario one, without a copayment accumulator, you can see the patient's copay applies, but they end up spending uh, uh, over the course of a year uh, just over $1,000, and the copayment uh, uh, program pays just over $7,000. They meet their deductible of 8500 On the other hand, if there's a copayment accumulator, the insurance gets paid twice, first by the, the uh, copayment uh, uh, assistance program, and then out-of-pocket costs by the insurance. So, so they end up getting basically double, so it's double dipping. So you remember this, uh, if you're a Seinfeld fan, um, you know, double dipping is not healthy, okay, for, or, or sanitary. So what's exciting is there actually uh, been progress in terms of copayment um, uh, or copayment accumulator policies, and 14 states, those in blue, have actually had policies already passed. Um, and basically what the policies say is that they have to count the money. They can't double dip. 
Um, and that's really important. And so if you're in a state that's there, that's great. We want to get national legislation. But if you're a state that's not there, you need to work at the state level as well as the um, national level. So what can we do? When you select uh, your insurance plan, and sometimes you don't have a choice, but if you do, talk to your health care benefits manager to make sure that, they're, that, that, that it aligns with what's important to you and the other employees. Um, again, we talked about the 14 states that have copayment accumulators. If you live in a state that does not ban copayment accumulators, you know, reach out to your state representatives, the state legislature, say this is important, this affects uh, me and a lot of, you know, your constituents, and this is why it should pass. And it, and it makes sense, so why, why should they be paid twice? It makes, it makes no sense. Again, this copayment surprise, and if you Google that, uh, it, it's, there are lots of articles about it harms patient care. Uh, this is from Massachusetts. Uh, one of the nurses' uh, um, advocates uh, uh, talked about it. But again, this patient is thinking, you know, they're, they're, it's great. I have a copayment uh, uh, card. Everything's being covered. Suddenly it runs out, and now they're being charged a second time because of the copayment accumulator program. So again, um, how can you find out? Well, you should have gotten something from your health insurance company that, that they have that kind of program. And it's important to review that language. Um, and then you can check with your health care benefits manager uh, in, your, in your employer to see if that's there. And then next time you're up for renewal, you can push for something that hopefully doesn't have that. So what can you do? Support the HELP Copayment Act, and, and uh, it's H.R. 830, and it requires health plans to count the value of the copay assistance, so pretty straightforward. It's important the more people that reach out to Congress, so get your family and friends to do so. It's an easy ask, I think. And then contact uh, not only your national, but your local um, to, 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 to pass it. So, well, does it increase cost? That's always the question. And this is a nice um, study that came out from the Global Healthy Living Foundation. They looked at states that have a copayment co uh, accumulator um, legislation versus states that don't. And basically, they saw that there was no real increase in costs. So you can say this study shows that it benefits patients and it does not increase health care costs. So, so it should be a no-brainer to pass this. So these are some of the resources um, uh, that, that are out there. Um, uh, and then uh, this is from the DDNC, um, uh, and uh, um, it just goes through all the negative impacts. And these are things you can leave with your legislature when you, when you go on the Hill. Um, and then it should be very easy with all these uh, electronic ways to contact your legislature to you know, put in your information, customize it, say, I'm so-and-so from Providence, Rhode Island. This is how it affects my patients. This is how it affects me uh, to, 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 to do that. So um, again, be aware of it, support it, and, and, and be a good advocate for it. And this is common sense le legislation I always talk about. And as uh, Brad already mentioned, step therapy has this radical notion that you and your doctor should decide your medicines, not your health insurance. So we, we, we think step therapy should hopefully pass as well. So my plug for that. And then uh, these are my copayment accumulators. So they're juniors right now. But the only thing that's rising faster in cost than um, uh, health care is college costs. And I was in shock when we were a couple weeks ago looking at colleges and looking at the cost of colleges. So this is going to be my latest copayment accumulator. So thank you. <laughs>
the next slide uh, shows you how uh, we're guided in uh, uh, using the funds that are appropriated to us. NIDDK has a strategic plan for research called Pathways to Health for All. This was published at the very end of uh, calendar year 2021, so it's been a little over a year that this strategic plan has been in place. Uh, NIDDK uh, supports research in, in numerous uh, diseases and conditions. Many of them are chronic and many of them are highly impactful. These include diabetes, kidney failure, many GI diseases such as uh, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, liver cirrhosis, and many others. Uh, our approach uh, to um, uh, overall at a high level to uh, uh, forwarding research in these many areas is to recognize that there's a lot of disease heterogeneity. And this is a current focus of many research programs. And these hope, hopefully will feed into developing better approaches to precision medicine. That is, we recognize that uh, even within a single disease category, people are affected in many different ways and uh, don't respond the same way to the same treatments. So we have to develop better approaches to treating them. We also recognize that we need a, a diverse workforce throughout the country uh, representing our many different communities. And finally, uh, an another theme of this report is to deal with the problem of health disparities. Particularly chronic diseases often affect different uh, minority populations in the United States uh, in a much more adverse ways than the general population. And we need to uh, invest additional resources in dealing with this problem. Uh, this uh, slide goes into a bit more detail in uh, what you can find in this high-level strategic uh, report. Uh, there are a number of different pillars illustrated here uh, by the hexagons. One foundational pillar is really basic research into biological pathways and into the environment and factors uh, that we need to understand uh, the causes uh, of diseases and potentially discover newer approaches to therapy. Along with this, we support research in clinical studies and clinical trials. Our approach here is to distinguish what we do from the pharmaceutical industry in uh, focusing on either early stage uh, research or um, research that uh, fills in gaps in areas that are not uh, covered by the pharmaceutical industry. When we find uh, uh, approaches that seem to work in uh, carefully controlled clinical studies, we then can move to carrying out what's called dissemination and implementation research that is trying to figure out in the real world how these advances in clinical trials can be used uh, broadly in practice throughout the country. Uh, another foundational uh, item in our strategic plan is stakeholder engagement. And what this means is that we need to not only engage uh, scientists and their institutions and their patients that were recruited into research studies, but also their families, their communities, uh, and others who have an important role in the final outcome of our research uh, programs. Intertwined between these different pillars are a number of other factors that are really cross-cutting. One is that throughout the whole process, we need to strengthen the, re the workforce. We need to re uh, assure that there will be a continuing pipeline of new investigators and that they have a diverse background. Another theme is that throughout all, we uh, want to improve the health of women who often, for one reason or another, have had less representation in research programs. We need to assure stewardship of uh, not only our resources and appropriation, but many other items that we have at our disposal to facilitate these research programs. And finally, as mentioned before, we need to focus on health equity and improving the health of minorities who are adversely affected.
moving on, uh, I'll tell you a little bit specifically about the division of digestive diseases and nutrition uh, in our programs within NIDDK. Our division is the primary uh, funder of research in digestive diseases. Um, and uh, the areas that we focus on include multiple different mission areas. And they're outlined here. Uh, it includes uh, most conditions of the alimentary GI tract, the liver and hepatobiliary system, diseases of the exocrine pancreas, including acute and chronic pancreatitis. And in addition, we focus on cross-cutting areas of nutrition research and obesity research. We don't do everything uh, at NIH in, uh, in our funding programs and examples to illustrate this are that, for example, most cancer research is uh, re assigned to the National Cancer Institute and research on acute infectious diseases usually uh, is assigned to the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Uh, uh, other uh, areas in which we spend uh, a fair amount of time and effort, if not the majority of funds, are training and career development. We have numerous uh, programs to assure that we have a pipeline of younger investigators who are coming along who will replace those who retire or exit from research careers. These uh, in, our, in, in IDDK focus mainly, ma mainly on um, undergraduate programs and postdoctoral, postgraduate to graduate student programs uh, for uh, earlier career development. We also support research infrastructure in a variety of different ways. One of the more prominent ones is that we have digestive diseases research core centers. There are 17 of them distributed throughout the United States, located at major research institutions, where they support the uh, research programs, usually of a large group of investigators conducting digestive disease research. We also have a mandate from Congress to disseminate new knowledge, and this comes in many forms, both information through publications for scientists and clinicians, but also information for the general public. And this includes our numerous web pages uh, that provide information for uh, the, the general public about uh, diseases and conditions within our mission areas. Finally, we have a number of uh, resources that we, su we support. Uh, NIDDK has a large uh, repository that includes both data and uh, samples obtained from clinical research studies. And these are made broadly available to investigators throughout the country. Shown on the right are some of the uh, 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 areas in which we conduct major large scale uh, usually consortium uh, activities in, for example, inflammatory bowel disease, gastroparesis, chronic pancreatitis, NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. We support a large research group uh, studying uh, usually uncommon but very serious disease, liver diseases of early childhood that often lead to transplantation. Liver Tox is a resource that we support uh, in conjunction with the National Library of Medicine. That's really a dictionary of information about uh, the toxicity, uh, liver toxicity of uh, medications. Uh, I mentioned the digestive disease centers. Uh, we have a liver cirrhosis network. It's relatively new that aims to understand uh, the uh, end stage of liver disease, which is fibrosis and cirrhosis. It's common to most liver diseases, trying to find ways to arrest or even reverse uh, cirrhosis that leads to liver failure and the need for transplantation. As an aside, besides the digestive disease centers, we also support nutrition and obesity uh, research centers as well. The next slide is a little bit about the money. Uh, the uh, Digestive Disease Division in the last fiscal year, 2022, 
uh, supported uh, about $640 million of uh, grant and cooperative agreements awards. Uh, the total number of these awards was over 1,400. This uh, donut uh, chart uh, shows, uh, you probably can't read this, uh, the details about how these funds are distributed. Uh, what I'll tell you in brief is that 83% of the awards are spent for what are called RPGs, research project grants. And so these are really the bread and butter uh, uh, types of uh, grant awards of many different kinds that support individual investigators throughout the United States to conduct their research. There's a little more detail here on this uh, next slide. Uh, in NIDDK, the great majority of the research project grants are called uh, RO1 grants. And these are uh, bread and butter uh, investigator initiated research proposals that are submitted to the NIDDK and peer reviewed and uh, funded uh, usually according to the recommendations of peer review committees uh, uh, to the extent that we have funds available to support them. The projects usually last for four to five years. Uh, and uh, uh, in the last fiscal year, uh, for example, we received over a thousand such applications Regrettably, because of the limitation of funds, uh, we are able to uh, afford supporting uh, only around 16% of these awards. Many of them are highly meritorious or would and would be funded if we had more funding available. There's another subcategory of these R01 grants and they're called ESI applications. Uh, ESI stands for early stage investigators, and these are defined as people within 10 years of their, their terminal uh, educational degree, usually a, a PhD or MD degree. And we give a, a somewhat of an advantage in funding to this group to be sure they're successful and to be sure that we have a continuing pipeline of younger investigators. So we fund a somewhat higher percentage of these individuals. So uh, another topic that's usually of interest is how do we support clinical studies and clinical trials involving humans? And overall, uh, about 20% of the uh, funds available are uh, awarded to uh, proposal, grant proposals in, in these, uh, this clinical studies uh, category. Uh, all of these involve uh, competitive grant applications from individual applicants. There are many different types of these awards. Some of them are very large. Some of them are small pilot studies. We have opportunities for investigator groups to organize on their own multi-center clinical trials. There's also uh, awards using small business uh, programs. And finally, we sometimes are, have the opportunity to join in participating in research programs that are funded either by uh, central NIH or by other institutes and centers. And again, uh, here are some of the examples of these large consortium multicenter uh, clinical studies in various uh, diseases within our mandate. Uh, we also support nutrition research. This has a very long history uh, of support. Uh, NIDDK is the largest supporter of nutrition research at uh, NIH. Uh, up until about two years ago, the Office of Nutrition Research was housed within the NIDDK. And over uh, several years prior to that, the uh, Office of Nutrition Research uh, formulated a, a very important strategic plan for nutrition research for all of NIH. And uh, you can find this online, and uh, there are many uh, 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 areas of future research needs and opportunities. Uh, some of these programs have already been launched uh, and are underway. In the meantime, about two years ago, the office was actually moved uh, to the office of the NIH director out of uh, the control of uh, and guidance of NIDDK. 
Uh, this, in fact, is seen as a major opportunity in terms of uh, increasing the visibility of nutrition research at NIH, hopefully uh, an opportunity to garner increased appropriations from Congress, and also to orchestrate uh, large-scale um, studies uh, that involve numerous uh, collaborative efforts from multiple NIH institutes. Uh, NIDDK uh, is already participating in uh, several of these. One of them is called Precision Nutrition Through All of Us, and uh, this involves the other major roadmap activity started by Dr. Collins called All of Us to capture information from up to a million people living in the United States. So this is an ongoing program and we have a major role in that. There are other examples whereby the NIH institutes uh, collaborate with each other. Uh, the NIH is not one place, but it, it consists of 27 uh, institutes, offices, and centers uh, which have uh, appropriations and all have their own uh, mission statements and, uh, in most cases, their own strategic plans to execute. So uh, uh, the NIDDK here represented in the center has, uh, in many ways, outreach to uh, numerous uh, centers and institutes that have overlapping missions and interests. I already mentioned the National Cancer Institute whereby we have collaborations for our common interest in uh, diseases that have a high risk for cancer. And there are many, many other examples uh, whereby we collaborate. And we collaborate uh, by sharing both funds and also personnel and scientific expertise. Uh, turning to another subject, uh, when we had uh, these types of meetings in person, we used to have the opportunity to hand out a glossy brochure, and this uh, current version is called NIDDK Recent Advances and Emerging Opportunities 2023. So this now, uh, 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 really beginning uh, just before the pandemic, became a virtual item, so uh, it's uh, uh, only glossy depending on what computer screen or device you're looking at it. Uh, the good news is it's uh, hard to lose it uh, because it's always uh, present on the internet, and it's also easy to send to other people. We do send this to every member of Congress every year, and it has an interesting um, mix of uh, important research advances. It has personal stories from individual pa uh, patients and subjects who've participated in research and their interesting stories. And it has special features of uh, a variety of types that appear every year. So I'd encourage you to take a look at this. Um, your elected members of Congress have already seen this. Uh, Finally, in closing, I point out that uh, I don't have time to go through all of our interesting activities, but you can find a lot on our website that we continuously update all the time. It has uh, areas uh, concentrating on research and funding opportunities, and these uh, can really be looked at by anyone, including interested investigators, scientists, um, trainees, and the general public to see what we're doing. As I mentioned before, we also provide a, a lot of different kinds of health information on many topics, and these are continuously updated. We have news items of various sorts. And finally, there's a whole section on uh, various aspects and reports from NIH uh, about our uh, various activities. And finally, in closing, uh, I because of the way this meeting is uh, set up, I don't have the opportunity to take questions from you directly. But if you do have questions, again, go to our website, and you can should be able to easily navigate to our uh, a tile here that is called Research Programs and Contacts. And you can actually find all of our staff are listed here and, and their areas of expertise. If you have questions or want to send us information, you should be able to email us easily. So with that, I'll close and thank you for your attention and the opportunity to speak today. But I want to switch gears 
a little bit right now, and we're not going to talk about federal legislation for the next few minutes. I want to talk about something else because there's a lot of different ways to advocate, right? A lot of different things that are important to us. And like Brad and Samir both mentioned, it's not just about the federal legislation either. Some things you want to start at home or do at home while you're on the national stage. And some things you just want to do in your workplace or in your school or someplace like that. And so we're going to talk a little bit about something that is actually pretty important to so many people. Um, we have with us Lynn Wolfson. And uh, Lynn is a dear friend of DDNC. And um, I have had the pleasure of being on the Hill with her in March. And so we were in the same team walking around the Capitol. And I learned so much from her. And so I asked her to come today and talk to us about what's called Lynn's Law. And for so many people who have GI illness, or maybe it's not even a GI illness, but somehow they're left in the situation where they have an ostomy or they're on um, parental or, or enteral nutrition, and there are things that they need in public restrooms that are just not there. And, um, and this is something that really inspired me. I heard her speak in March, went home. I actually, as most of you know, or some of you may know that I also I do some part-time work at Starbucks. I'm actually like talking to them. It's like there's so many things that we can be doing, just not here, just here on Washington, but our home states, asking governors, our local legislators, even our friends, and um, and places we shop and things like that to help with this particular issue, um, which really and truly affects so many Americans. And so, Lynn, I'm not going to talk any more about this because I want you to come and tell us all about it. Are you going to sit? No. I'm gonna sit. Oh. Right, right, right. Of course. I apologize, but I didn't think about that. Okay. Thank you. And I think it's the, it's the top one that, no, the bottom one is your Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, International Foundation for Functional Gastrointestinal Disorders. First, I'd like to thank Cecile Ruger for giving me the honor of speaking today. My name is Lynn Wolfson, and I'm honored to be here to speak about my rare genetic disorder, Hirschsprung's disease, and Lynn's Law. With Hirschsprung's disease, the ganglion or nerve cells do not form or function in parts of the intestines of the fetus resulting in the digestive tract's inability to move food and feces smoothly through the intestines. This results in severe constipation, projectile vomiting, obstructions, distension, intestinal ruptures, malnutrition, and lots of pain. I had my first colostomy at the age of seven in 1963. Since then, I've had seven more ostomies. I currently have an ileostomy for defecation, a gastrostomy to vent my stomach contents, and I catheterize six times a day to urinate. I have had over 50 surgeries and have spent a lot of time in the intensive care unit, been on life support, been fed enterally, and I'm currently on parental nutrition. In addition, my cervical disc ruptured in 2006 as a result of malnutrition. So my head is now screwed on. Despite all my issues, I managed to graduate college and earn two college degrees. Despite, I am married for over 36 years and have two adult daughters two grandsons, and a granddaughter. I worked for nine years as a corporate executive and 16 years as a high school math teacher. My family has always enjoyed traveling. So we began to learn everything we needed to know about my PN, ostomies, and catheterizing so I'd be able to travel the world with my family. We first started with the United States. One of my trips was to fly to St. Louis to pick up my daughter's car in Southern Illinois 
and drive back to Fort Lauderdale with a stop in Little Rock, Arkansas to pick up my daughter's belongings. Everything went well until we were a few hours into Arkansas. I felt my ostomy bag expanding. So we stopped at a supermarket for me to use the restrooms while my daughter shopped for some snacks to eat in the car. I walked into the supermarket handicap restroom stall, which was a little space with a raised toilet and grab bars and a toilet paper holder. I was alone in the restroom stall with my service dog, Zev. I had no place to place my, my PN backpack. This, which I put on my chair here. I needed to sit on the toilet to change my ostomy wafer as it was starting to leak. So I placed my backpack on the filthy floor out of desperation. I put my phone in the dog's backpack and I took my ostomy supplies out of Zeb's backpack. I had no place to put them, so I shoved them in his mouth. Ori is demonstrating this for you. Okay, Zev is now retired and his hind legs didn't work, don't work so well, so he didn't want to take the picture. <laughs> so I'm using Ori and Ori, I think you've all seen, she's laying underneath the table. I took off my leaky wafer and bag and placed them in a bag I had brought with me. It is at this point that my ostomy went crazy and started shooting everywhere. My hands, thighs, clothes, shoes, toilet, floor, backpack, and dog were covered in feces. I could not get to my phone. Toilet paper was useless. Thank goodness another lady came in to use the restroom and I asked her to go have my daughter page the customer service. What a humiliating and embarrassing situation. Of course, my daughter came, bought wipes in the supermarket, since there were no paper towels, and got me clean clothes from the car. I was very upset about the situation and thought hard on how this could have been avoided. What if my daughter was not in the store with me? We went to Japan soon after this incident. My daughter came with my husband and myself. As soon as we landed in Tokyo, of course we went straight to the restroom after the very long flight. I was pleasantly surprised to see a symbol for an ostomy restroom. I never heard of such a thing. Of course, I went in and found an ostomy dedicated toilet, which looked like a laundry room sink made out of porcelain. I was able to empty my bag while standing over the sink and use the base to wash out and use the hose to wash out my bag. There was a trash box above the sink to dispose of the bag. There was also paper towels and a hook to hang my backpack. Wherever we went in Japan, I encountered a similar setup. Wow, I was so impressed. So how could I make this happen in the USA? I needed to think of a way that I could do this with minimal money. First, I loved the Japanese ostomy toilets. I realized that I could not ask every public institution in the USA to purchase new toilets. So I thought about what I really needed to prevent the situation that happened in Arkansas. I realized I needed a hook to hang my PM. The hook behind the door is too far away from the toilet. The tubing does not go that far. There needs to be a hook five feet above the floor by the toilet. Then I pl need a place to put all of my ostomy supplies. These supplies include a disposable bag, wipes, powder, skin protectant wipes, barrier ring, a wafer, an ostomy bag, barrier strips, and scissors. In addition, I need a place for my catheterizing supplies. This is a sterile kit which includes all the sterile supplies needed to self-catheterize. So a shelf by the toilet at seated level should be able to accommodate these supplies. 
Next issue is that in order to properly catheterize and to prevent urinary infections, it is necessary to pull down pants, wash hands, then catheterize. However, without a sink, this is very difficult. Antibacterial soap does not get rid of dirt that may be on my hands. Also, after washing my hands, I need to put on sterile gloves. My hands need to be thoroughly dry to put these gloves on. A sink with soap and paper towels is necessary in all handicapped stalls. I understand that in the oldest parts of the USA, there is minimal space and possibly no space to add plumbing for a sink in a cubicle. However, in Japan, I found it interesting to see toilets and closets with sinks above the toilet's water tanks. The dirty water from the sink drained into the toilet to be reused as toilet water. An osman could sit backwards on one of these toilets and have access to the sink while the ostomy can drip into the toilet. Not only that, the toilets were heated. <laughs> With all those, you see all those uh, buttons there on the left side. Water and paper towels are needed to clean up any mess that is made by the ostomy. Cleaning up with toilet paper is an impossible task. An ostomate and catheterizer need to use the handicap stall as they are truly the bathroom handicap. Too many people who do not need the handicap stall tend to enjoy the additional space provided. Consequently, there needs to be a sign on handicap stalls which say, handicap only. Too often I have found using syringes, I have found used syringes in parking lots. People on PN and diabetics use needles. They need to be able to properly dispose of them. There needs to be a syringe disposal box where there are four or more stalls. In other words, I'm not going after the mom and pop stores. I then created my own bill, Lynn's Law. Lynn's Law would make handicapped restroom stalls more accessible to people with digestive diseases by one, having a shelf at seated level for ostomy and catheterizing supplies. Two, a hook five feet above the floor by the toilet to hang feeding backpacks. Three, a sink and paper towels in all handicapped stalls. Four, a sign on handicap stall stating they are for handicap only. Five, a syringe disposal box in bathrooms with four more stalls. Here is a proposed bathroom design. Lynn's Law is now part of the United Ostomy Associations of America's guidelines for ostomy friendly restrooms. In my hometown of Western Florida, we now have a mandate for all city handicap restroom stalls, which include a hook and a shelf by the toilet, a sink, and paper towels. My city commissioner, Chris Eddy, was able to get that passed for all ostomates and medically fed individuals. And then I was on the cover of the Weston uh, Newsday Tuesday. <laughs> That's me. That's Zev, by the way, my other my other um, service dog. Um, they did put the shelf over there. If you sit backwards, you can use that shelf. I really preferred the shelf on the left side by the toilet paper. But I wasn't going to criticize them. I was very happy that they did something. Florida Representative Robin Bartleman has written a bill for the Florida House of Representatives. However, this bill only refers to the hook. It is a beginning. As a result of my advocating with politicians at all levels in reference to Lynn's Law, I've been given appointments by Florida Senator Nan Rich. So now I am on the Broward County Board of Rules and Appeals, the Broward County Plumbing Committee, the Broward County Structural and Architectural Committee, the Broward County Fire Code Committee. It is through these appointments that I hope to get Lynn's Law passed in Broward County. So. What can, what can you do to help get Lynn's Law passed or, or United Ostomy Associations of America's guidelines for ostomy-friendly restrooms passed for your state? 
Speak to businesses which you frequent. If they are national businesses, write to their corporate headquarters. See if you can get your work location and places of worship to implement these guidelines. Meet and write to your state and local legislature. Meet with your local hospitals. Talk to your doctors about making their restrooms more accessible. I am here to show that if Lynn's Law can become national, so many more digestive disease patients will feel so much more comfortable coming out in public, traveling, and living life, and living fuller lives. Digestive disease patients can be productive individuals who can give back to society and, li and live meaningful lives. I am only one human being. However, there is a quote that one person can change the world. And I want to be that person that can help make the world a better place for digestive disease patients.